Hey there, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Kaderna Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna, and as always, I'm happy to have you joining us. So before we dive into this week's episode, I'd just like to give everyone a friendly reminder. Wherever you're tuning in, whether it's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, please do consider sharing the link and leaving us a five-star review. That's been incredibly helpful thus far in getting more reach and expanding our audience so that more and more folks out there can learn about wealth and achieving it in its original meaning, which is a state of well-being. Again, that's the ultimate goal here, folks, on the Kaderna podcast. So without further ado, what are we going to be talking about this week? What we're going to address are defined benefit pensions. And the reason that I wanted to spend some time here is I actually received a call from a client of mine last week that said, I work at one of the major airline companies, and I was kind of surprised I got a notice in the mail asking that if I would consider an early retirement. And the reason for this, and you're going to find more and more of this in the news if you haven't heard already, is several of the major airline carriers still offer what are called defined benefit pensions. And just to take a quick step back, if you're not familiar with what that is, a defined benefit pension is a retirement vehicle that, per the name, assures its employees a defined benefit or a monthly payment every month throughout their entire retirement so long as they live. And several of them also also have what's called a survivorship option that says if you're to predecease your spouse, they could also receive a monthly benefit for the rest of their lives as well. So obviously a pretty cool plan. If you just listen to what I said or rewind it, you'll say, wow, that's pretty awesome. I'm going to get essentially paid the rest of my life, even though I'm not working. That's correct. That is what a defined benefit pension is. Now, with the current coronavirus pandemic, which has obviously hit the economy very hard, it's hit the travel industry especially hard. So as they're looking at ways just to stay afloat, to stay in business and be here next year and years moving forward, and considering this huge obligation that they may carry in a defined benefit pension, they're looking for solutions. So what we're going to talk about today is what these pensions are, how they work, and what some of those solutions are, and what it means to you, the individual, should you be entitled to one. So if we can take kind of like a 10,000 foot view of the retirement planning landscape, which I know in prior episodes we've certainly alluded to, but I want to talk about these fixed payments, because that's essentially the best way to recreate income in retirement, which we all need if we plan on retiring. So right now, the largest source of retiree income would be Social Security. And that's a great analogy to the pension because they kind of work in similar ways. Social Security says, okay, if you work X amount of years, you make Y amount of money, and then you retire at a certain age, you know, usually between 62 to 70, you're going to get a certain payment for the rest of your life. Okay. In a moment, I'll tell you how a pension is quite similar to that. But if you've been following Social Security at all or or some of our prior episodes here on the podcast, you might be aware that it is in kind of financial dire straits right now. And there's a few reasons for that. When we want to assure somebody a fixed payment for the rest of their life, that's a big unknown. right? We don't know if the rest of their life could be another three years or another 33 years. And as these benefits have gotten higher and higher, it's obviously hard to fund them. If we look at Social Security, the Social Security Administration projects that their trust fund will be depleted in the year 2034. That's a statistic that I've been quoting for about a decade now. And I would always kind of say it and people can kind of brush it off. But now as we open a calendar and we look at year 2020, 2034 does not seem that far off anymore, which is a little bit nerve wracking. So if that's the number one source of retiree income, Number two today is defined benefit pensions, and they are really quickly going by the wayside for some of the similar pressures that Social Security feels. And then number three, which we're not really going to touch on today, is what's called a defined contribution plan, or what most of you guys probably know as a individual retirement account, an IRA, or your 401k plan. All right, And again, per the name, it's a defined contribution. We know what's going in, 
but we don't necessarily what's, know what's coming out when we retire. Whereas the defined benefit takes that worry away. We know what we are going to get when we retire. So if we look at you know Social Security, we know that that's in, in a tough position today. But let's look at pensions and how they work. So somewhat similar. It's going to be based on your years of service to that company, your income that you generated in those years of service, and then we're going to calculate those two to essentially spit out a certain monthly benefit at an assumed retirement age, perhaps age 60 or age 65, that will then say, okay, every single month, we're going to give you X amount of dollars for the rest of your life. So if we look at some of the biggest pension plans out there, they would be owned by the federal government or state and local governments. Now, according to the Pew Research Institute in the Pew Charitable Trust 2019 report, if we look at the state level right now in America, there is a $1.28 trillion, with a T, $1.28 trillion deficit for state pensions. Okay, The worst state in America would be Kentucky, which has their pension plan only funded at 34%. The second or worst, unfortunately, would be my home state of New Jersey, which has their pension plans funded at about 36%. And by the dollar, New Jersey actually has the largest deficit uh, currently at about $209 billion. Okay. So again, these are extremely difficult to fund for a few reasons. Like I mentioned, we could have an employee, and I know some folks in this position, that could actually collect more uh, on a, a monthly basis or an annual basis in their retirement years than in their working years. Let's take a police officer that started working at 23 years old and then retired at 55. Okay, so they work there for the department for 32 years. Then at 55, they retire and immediately begin collecting their pension and they live until they're 90. All right, so now they've been collecting without working at all for 35 years while they worked for that department or that locality or state for 32 years. So now you could actually be collecting longer than you actually were putting in as an employee. And the other thing is those benefit amounts could actually be larger while not working than when you were working. Because many of these pension plans have a formula that averages your higher year's salary or income. All right, so you could be getting a pension at 55, 56, that is way higher than the salary you got 30 years ago when you were just 23, 24, 25 years old. So as you can imagine, just looking at it that way, the math doesn't quite add up. Then when we look at the actual funds that go into the pension programs, today with interest rates being so low, it's oftentimes not offering the yield that, that these pension plans need to produce those outputs or those benefits. And then we take into account market volatility and all of these things. And then, you know, the coronavirus, you know, that has hit like the travel industry. And you talk about their general revenues are way off the mark. And it all becomes essentially kind of one pool of money here for that company uh, to try and stay afloat, but then also take care of their retired employees. So if we've seen the Social Security fund obviously struggle immensely, we've seen the states uh, right now, again, in dire straits, I hate to keep using that term, but there's almost no other way to describe it. Uh, you can see how difficult the, the situation can be. And then if we take it down to the private level, so you say, all right, well, we're not talking Social Security. Good analogy, though. We're talking about pensions, but I don't work for the state. I'm fortunate enough to work for a big company that offers me a pension. All right, there's not many of them left out there, but there are a few. And if you're in that boat, you're probably saying to yourself, my pension plan is essentially like a golden ticket. It may be the most valuable thing to account for in my retirement. So let's take a look at how these things work. So if you're entitled to a pension, your big concern with what's going on in the news might be, well, am I actually going to get that pension? And I often tell people it is not a guarantee Okay, it is a promise, and we need to be able to delineate between the two. A guarantee, we know we're getting it no matter what. A promise is a company saying, we're going to give it to you, but that's only their word. And that's essentially what a pension is. If that company cannot stay solvent, that doesn't mean that pension will always be there. And if you're saying, well, hang on a minute, what if the economy goes haywire, my company goes belly up, 
did I just completely lose my pension? Most private pension plans today belong to a program called the PBGC, or the Pension Benefit Guarantee uh, Corporation. That's a U.S. government agency that essentially is like a backstop to these private pension plans, okay? So that if your company did go bust, you can still be assured that some of your retirement will be there. So the PBGC came about in 1974 as a result of the ERISA Act, which is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And what it says is that every participating plan must pay a premium, essentially an insurance premium, to the corporation so that if something were to happen, the PBGC can then come assist them. Okay. So right now, the PBGC is covering 35 million American workers. Uh, out in the private sector that are waiting on a pension plan. They do not cover church programs, uh, federal, state, or local pensions uh, by large. These are particularly for private pensions. One key thing to kind of keep in a, uh, account here, the PBGC is not funded by tax revenue. It's strictly funded by those premiums from the companies that are a part of the plan, okay? So you might be saying, well, Social Security that we talked about earlier, yeah, it's in dire straits and in 2034, it's supposed to just go bust. But the U.S. government can always say, well, we'll raise taxes or at that point, we'll have so many workers out there that uh, are paying. It almost becomes like a bit of a Ponzi scheme that can keep feeding the future payments. All right. Some state and local pension plans also have a bit of that luxury, too, perhaps through their property taxes or other resources. A private pension does not really have that ability, and the PBGC, which is backing that up, does not have that ability either. They're just collecting those companies' premium payments and then investing it and hoping to have a pool of money available for if catastrophe should strike. So in 2019, the PBGC paid over 932,000 retirees their pension payments. Uh, over the span of 4,900 different companies. So if you're saying, well, have they ever actually been utilized? Like do companies go bankrupt and erase their plan? There you go. In 2019, they paid almost a million retirees pension payments. All right. The BBGC is currently responsible, responsible for about 1.5 million retiree payments if we take into those uh, that I just mentioned and future retirees of those companies. So they're, uh, they're kicking it into high gear right now, paying out quite a bit. And if you're saying, well, that, that gives me some solace that there's a backstop here, but would I get the same exact pension payment? Maybe, all right? In 2020, okay, so in, in the current year, if you're age 65, the maximum pension benefit that you could get from PBGC would be $5,812 a month, or about $69,750 a year. So if you had a very lofty plan through your company, you worked there a long time, you were an executive making a lot of money, you might have been anticipating a pension of 100,000 or even beyond. And if that company could no longer fulfill its obligations, you could very easily notice a reduction down to about 70,000 at a maximum, okay? And if you're wondering, well, you just said that they're a government agency, but they don't have any taxing authority and they don't receive tax revenue, well, how's the PBGC doing? You know, that kind of old saying, who's watching the guards? Well, in the fiscal year uh, 2018, their, their annual report, they showed a financial deficit in multi-employer programs, a net deficit of $53.9 billion. Okay, I can see some of the draws dropping just through the screen here uh, that, yes, this is supposed to be the caretaker of the pension, and you're realizing here they have an enormous deficit on the multi-employer programs, okay? It is projected that that program will completely run out of money in 2025, okay? So now we're in 2020. That's only five years away, folks, which is pretty uh, nerve-wracking yet again. So what a multi-employer program is, just to take a step back, is covering employers with a pension that consist of two or more employers in a collective bargaining agreement. All right, typically that's going to be plans with a union. All right, so think like construction, retail, hospitality, 
um, electrical, iron workers, things of this nature uh, that are backed up by this multi-employer program, which again, like I said, has almost a $54 billion deficit. Now, there's another aspect of the PBGC that's for single employers, okay, which per the name is just one employer with one pension plan. The single employer program is in better shape. It used to run a deficit, but now shows a net position of a positive $2.4 billion. So that side is doing okay, and that's the side that for single employer plans, they could literally take over the entire pension and assume all of those payments to its retirees where the multi-employer program, which could be extinct in just five years, that program is not meant to take over pensions. It's meant to just send some money to essentially assist those pension programs. All right, so that's a little bit about the PBGC. Again, that's the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. So now you might be saying, well, what do companies do if things hit the fan, they have a gigantic obligation ahead of them to pay all these retirees benefits. And right now, you know, they're saying we can hardly keep the business afloat. Forget about that enormous liability coming down the pike to all these baby boomers and retirees. Well, they have a couple options. The first would be what's called a standard termination in which they show the PBGC that they do have enough money, um, but they want to and need to get rid of their pension plan or will have uh, severe consequences to the company itself. And there's two ways they can do this standard termination. The first would be a lump sum payment to its employees, right? Kind of like the client that I alluded to at the beginning uh, at the airline carrier that's offering those early retirements. So the company is saying, okay, instead of being on the hook for who knows, maybe another 30 or 40 years paying you every single month, what we'll do is we'll just offer you a check saying almost like a settlement, take this amount of money and then we'll call it a day, no more pension, you know, you'll be happy with your money and we'll be happy to have that liability erased. That's one option. Another thing is they could take this pension and essentially put it into an annuity, buy an annuity from an insurance company that then will kind of mimic the pension and pay that client, you know, in perpetuity, but through the annuity company as opposed to the, the uh, employer's uh, pocketbook. That's your standard termination. Then there's another called a distress termination. This is typically done through bankruptcy or the company going to the PBGC and proving to them that they do not have the money to meet these benefits and that if they keep the pension plan afloat, it will crush the company. They'll no longer be able to even operate the business. And that's when the PBGC could uh, essentially come in and take over the plan. Now you're saying, well, that all sounds good. There's a contingency, but what about this whole PBGC that you talked about a $54 billion deficit just a couple of minutes ago? The PBGC also reserves the right to terminate a plan, okay? So I'll state that again. That means that you could work for an employer that says we can no longer fund this pension. We need to scrap it. And then the PG, PBGC may come in to save the day and assume those payments, but they also have the right to terminate the plan if they cannot stay solvent or service that account or that employer's plan. So you got to be aware of these things. And, and that's why sometimes when you're offered that lump sum payment, there's a lot of different variables you may want to take into account here when we're talking about an indefinite retirement that could be another 10 years or 40 years. So now that we have an idea of what these pensions are and you know what the kind of the safety protocols are behind it, let's discuss just for a brief moment the real world in some cases to kind of put this to perspective. So one that um, was pretty notable was back in 2011, actually on November 29th, 2011, American Airlines filed bankruptcy. They ended the pension plans of over 130,000 workers and handed it over to the PBGC. Okay, they weren't the first airline to do this, but maybe the biggest at that time. That was in 2011. Maybe the, the biggest and most notable of the whole pension conversation happened in 2012, just a year later, with GM, okay, General Motors. GM cut their pension obligations by over $26 billion by offering 42,000 of their employees a lump sum payment 
or a group annuity that was going to be sponsored through Prudential. Okay, so that was a GM. Now, if you want to think about it, you say, okay, that was nice of them to either A, get an annuity through Prudential, or B, say, hey, here's a check, a lump sum to essentially go away. But we're talking about erasing $26 billion of obligations. So if we just do the math there, uh, you know, certainly helpful to GM, that maneuver. But if we look at the retirees on the other side, uh, you know, it may not be quite what they had anticipated all their years while they were working and hoping for that pension. And then in more recent news, in 2017, a Cleveland pension, uh, which was the Iron Workers Local 17 Pension Fund, uh, had a proposal in which they wanted to extend the lifespan of the pension by reducing benefits for current retirees. And half of 2,000 of their participants immediately noticed a cut in their, be- their pension benefits. So this is something now that, that companies can do is actually not only change the pension plan for their employees, but also change the pension benefits for their current retirees so long as they can show proof that they are just financially not able to continue. So in closing, guys, that's uh, the, the current environment that we're working in. And as many of you have probably realized, back in the day, if you will, people had the security of retiring saying, I'm getting paid by the government via Social Security. I'm getting paid by the company via my defined benefit pension. And essentially, I put my time in at work, and now I can kind of sail off into the sunset in the golden years. And now as this is all kind of playing out, particularly with the baby boomer generation retiring, we're seeing that the math, frankly, does not add up. And that's why there's sweeping changes to so many of these programs. And we saw it first on the private sector because, frankly, they don't have the ability just to go out and tax people and take more money in uh, whenever they need to. And that's the reason why I've said, even from the very first episode of this podcast, more and more of the responsibility every day is being shifted from the government or the big company all the way down to the individual to pave your own way. And that's essentially what came about when we saw that, you know, all the way back in the 70s, when they said these pension plans just don't really look like they're sustainable, let's create a defined contribution plan. And then we had the rise of the 401k and the 403b, TSP, deferred comp plans, IRAs, et cetera, where it said, now it's on you. Now it's your turn to take those earnings and save and invest for your future because we cannot promise that defined benefit anymore. So keep these things in mind. And if you are sitting there saying, I am entitled to a pension, kudos, it is worth more value than most could ever realize, but get to know what some of the contingency plans are, especially if you're working in the private sector, because there's only so much money to go around folks. And if you're in the public sector, with a locality, a state, or the federal government, you do have quite a bit more certainty uh, because of that taxing ability and the government standing behind you. But just keep in mind, a lot of those plans for current workers are going through uh, changes. It's a political uh, hot button issue that's being addressed. And some of the benefits we saw mom and dad or grandma and grandpa retire with will likely be very, very different Uh, when current generations such as millennials that are now working uh, eventually retire. So thank you all for tuning in to another episode of the Kaderna podcast. If you have questions, thoughts, guests that you'd like to propose, again, email us at thekadernapodcast at gmail.com or reach out to us through any social media platforms and we'll continue to bring you the best content we can. Thanks and have a great week. The Kaderna Podcast is for informational purposes only. Individual situations may vary, and the information should be relied upon only when coordinated with individual professional advice. Guardian and its subsidiaries do not provide tax, legal, social security, student loan, mortgage, or real estate advice. Listeners should contact their own tax, accounting, or legal advisors, or the social security department in this matter. All investments and investment strategies contain risk and may lose value. Brian Kaderna is a registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC. Pass. 300 Broad Acres Drive, Suite 175, Bloomfield, New Jersey, 07003. Securities, product services, and advisory services are offered through Pass, a registered broker-dealer and investment advisor. 
973-244-4420. Financial representative, the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. Pass is an indirect wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. Caderna Financial Team and International Planning Alliance, LLC, are not affiliates or subsidiaries of Pass or Guardian. Caderna Financial Team is a division of International Planning Alliance, LLC, a general agency of Guardian. Pass is a member of FINRA, SIPC. California Insurance License Number, OK04194. Content of the Caderna Podcast is copyright of Brian M. Caderna, all rights reserved. Any redistribution or reproduction of part or all of the content in any form is prohibited without prior permission from the Caderna Podcast. The views and opinions expressed herein may not be those of Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates. Guardian does not verify and does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of, of the information or opinions presented herein. Any third-party materials referenced cannot be endorsed or verified by Guardian and are used as the opinion of the author. Guardian, its subsidiaries, or affiliates do not provide or issue or advise for mortgages. This material contains the current opinions of the author, but not necessarily those of Guardian or its subsidiaries, and such opinions are subject to change without notice.